So good evening. Uh, I'm Neil Gordon, CEO of the Discovery Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to the second event in the 2023 Discovery Museum Speaker Series. Tonight's event, Who's Raising the Kids? Big Tech, Big Business, and the Lives of Kids. And tonight's guest is, is Dr. Susan Lin, and the discussion will be not moderated by Nancy Pearl. I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. So before we get started, a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be a time for questions at the end of Susan's presentation. So please submit your questions anytime using the Q&A button, and we'll address as many of them as possible at our conclusion. You can use the chat button for any technical questions, and closed captioning can be turned on and off at the bottom of your screen. And we are recording tonight's presentation, a link to which will be sent to all the registrants once it's available. Um, we wanna thank very much our speaker series sponsors. Tonight's event is free thanks to the support of Enterprise Bank, Sutherland Realty Group, NetScout, and along with the other sponsors who are shown here. Also, I wanna thank those of you who made a donation to support the series along with your reservation for tonight's event. This year's speaker series theme is Conversation, Understanding, Hope. These events will be conversations on topics that can be challenging for families or for anyone really uh, to navigate their way through. But we will be guided by the informed and insightful speakers who can help bring understanding to these topics. And through that understanding, a hopeful perspective on the future. The events in the schedule are shown here, and the registration is open now on our website. Before I get started, uh, I just want to take a moment to share some really great news about the Discovery Museum. Yesterday, the Discovery Museum was named a finalist for the 2023 National Medal from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. The medal is the highest honor in the museum industry. In the words of IMLS, the award honors institutions for their extraordinary public service and remarkable community contributions. We are deeply honored to be recognized and we're really grateful for the support of our community that has enabled us to have a positive impact on the lives of kids and families for more than 40 years. The winners of this award will be announced in May. So what is the work of the Discovery Museum that earned us this honor? The Discovery Museum works to support kids and families by providing play-based learning experiences that are rooted in science and nature. We create exhibits and programs that spark kids' natural creativity and their curiosity, and of course, make learning fun. Then we work really hard to make those experiences available to every kid. We offer a range of free programs designed for families with children experiencing a disability and are proud to report that 25% of our visitors are served for free or nearly free each year. We're also proud of our work around sustainability with ambitious goals to reduce the museum's carbon footprint. Last year, we became the first children's museum in the country to generate 100% of its electricity through on-site solar. We produce more electricity than we need, in fact, and provide the excess to five other nonprofits at a discount, making Discovery Museum one of the largest nonprofit clean energy providers in the state of Massachusetts. We try to do this work in a way that is visible to our visitors to help educate and inspire the next generation of Earth's caretakers. We're proud to celebrate the Discovery Museum's 40th anniversary last year, and we took a look back at our history and it reaffirmed the basic principles of how we need to support kids and families for the next 40 years. With that, we will continue our work to help prepare kids to be curious and active citizens in a complex and diverse world to use their voices to stand up for themselves, to stand up for truth, science, and each other, and to confront perhaps the biggest issue of their future, climate sustainability. 
And we'll do all this work in ways that are fun, memorable, and have a meaningful impact for kids. So with that, I'm, I'm really pleased and excited that Dr. Susan Lin and Nancy Pearl are joining us tonight. And it's great to see you, see you both. I just wanna tell everybody a little bit about the two of you and then we'll have a chance to get started. So um, Susan is an author and a psych psychologist and an award-winning ventriloquist. She's also a world-renowned expert on creative play and the impact of media and commercial marketing on children. Her books have been praised in publications as diverse as the Wall Street Journal, Mother Jones, and the New York Times. Her work has been featured on Good Morning America, Today, 60 Minutes, Dateline, The Colbert Report, and the acclaimed documentary, The Corporation. Susan has lectured on the importance of creative play, the impact of media and marketing on children, and the use of puppetry as a therapeutic tool in venues throughout North and South America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Among many honors, Susan has received a, a, an UNIMA USA citation for excellence as a special award for puppet therapy from the Puppeteers of America, a Champion of Freedom Award from the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Creative Leadership Award from the Puppet Showplace Theater, and a presidential citation from the American Psychological Association for her work on behalf of children. Now, we're really excited to have with us as well, um, Susan Pearl, who will be interviewing Nancy. Na uh, no, Nancy Pearl <laughs> will be interviewing Susan. <laughs> too, many, too many people here, I'm confused. Nancy is the retired executive director of the Washington Center for the Book at the Seattle Public Library and the author of Book, the Book Lust series, four titles which are filled with recommendations for good books to read. Now, to ensure that Susan was going to get lots of tough questions, we invited Nancy to interview her because Nancy and Susan are sisters. And who can ask you tougher questions than your <laughs> sister? Um, so, Nancy and Susan, it's really great to, uh, to have you with us tonight, and we look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I can speak for myself and my baby sister and say we're we're so happy to be here tonight. <laughs> um, so Susan, first I have to say congratulations. You have a new baby granddaughter. Um, very yeah, exciting. brand new and right. and uh, brand new and. I know that this is going to sound weird, but really one of my first thoughts in looking at her beautiful face was, and she doesn't even know anything about McDonald's or Disney or Google or Microsoft. And it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I know it's an idiosyncratic response, but honestly, I, I couldn't help thinking that. I think every every modern parent probably looks at their first child or grandchild and says exactly those things. Absolutely. <laughs> just ahead oh, of they me. don't know about McDonald's and you know. <laughs> All right. So this is your third book, Susan. And um you've dealt with some of the issues in this book one way or another in your earlier two books. What what was the impetus to write? this particular book? Well, I'm tempted to say masochism, but no. Um, really, it's because um, I began doing this work and, and um, advocating to protect kids from the commercialization of their lives in 1998. And my first two books were published before the digital revolution, really. So way before tablets, way before smartphones. And the technology just changed everything so much. I mean, kids were targeted for marketing before and, um, and it was terrible for them. And I know today we look back on television and say, oh, that's so quaint, but it was a really powerful tool for advertising to kids. But now with the new technologies, they're so much more 
powerful. So the intent of marketers and the intent of, of these huge corporate conglomerates to take over children's lives, to transform them into accepting um, consumers and consumerism, um, the technology makes it just so much more powerful. I mean, because today, um, it, marketers know a lot about the children. I mean, they can target them individually with advertising and with techniques that are designed to hook them on their, you know, their vulnerabilities, their strengths, their weaknesses, their interests. And it's just awful to think of kids being exploited that way. And it's also really harmful for them. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> Susan, what made you in the beginning, before before this book, before the consuming kids, before you know you you started writing about it, and you know what made you especially interested in in this whole early childhood um, focus, really mm -hmm. that that you that you feel so strongly about? I I know we had yeah. this childhood and playing we had wonderful games imaginative games. right right um you know our i mean for one thing our our mother was an early childhood person mm -hmm. so so she really valued early childhood and um and i think that made a big difference to me and when i was uh, 21, she sent me um, a book by Dr. Barry Brazelton called Infants and Mothers, and I read it, and that really changed everything for me, I think. I mean, I, I began to really understand um, the importance of, of early childhood and that babies aren't just blobs or, you know, that, that they're feeling people and that what happens to them, you know, really matters. So, so from there, I went on to read a lot of books about child development and just got more and more interested in it. But, but also, I think what you say is accurate that, that their incredible capacity to play is still such a delight for me. And I have you know, the best memories of my childhood, I won't speak for yours, are, is the amazing creative play that we did together. I mean, your dollhouse where, you know, the Shakespeare family lived or we used to you know, put on plays or, um, I mean, it was, it was the best part of childhood. And for some reason, it's still really vivid to me. And when I, I met, you know, Fred Rogers um, before I started doing some work with him, I mean, he said to me, I took out my puppets and he met my puppets and he said, you must remember what it's like to be a child. And I think that in, in some way that I do. And, 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 and I remember, you know, the as I said, the wonders of the creativity, but also how vulnerable children are, right. and how important their well-being is not just to their families, but really to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I thought you were going to ask me why I started writing about about commercialism or why that well, bothered me so much. Was that your next question? Was indeed my next question. <laughs> I remember well, one day, I remember one day you talked about you had given a speech to a group of kids I think teenagers maybe and you said you looked out at the audience and every other kid was wearing a shirt advertising some you know Nike with a Nike swoosh right. and I thought about all the t-shirts I have <laughs> exactly that same thing and quickly gave them all away so, of course right yeah like, yeah i mean you know like it's it's clear that child sexual abuse or child physical abuse is harmful to children but advertising looks benign 
you know, how could SpongeBob SquarePants be bad for kids or Dora the Explorer or, you know, all of, the, you know, whatever character it is, how could they be bad for children when they're so lovable and even yeah. sometimes talk about important things? But basically just about everything um, in the world of entertainment for children is designed to sell them something to design to sell them food or clothing. I mean, Dora the Explorer isn't just, you know, advertising even her own show. She's advertising, you know, cookies and crackers and, and you know, other media. Um, and, and there's barely, even on PBS, which has some wonderful shows, but there's barely anything in children's tech or media that isn't selling them something. And mm -hmm. so the message that kids are getting is that the program isn't enough. They have to have something else. And, and you know, they have to have a toy or they have to have, you know, the food or, or whatever. Um, and so really uh, what we're doing is immersing them in a culture that celebrates consumption. And, and that's bad for kids in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, kids with materialistic values are actually less happy than kids who have less materialistic values. They also have more psychosomatic illnesses, more stress in their, in their families. But, but now it's, it's even, more worrisome, we're in a climate crisis that is fueled by consumption. But I know. But, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good pun, but it actually isn't funny. Yeah. Um, but you know, the idea that that we we are training kids to consume when it's consumption that's going to you know destroy not just them but the planet. I mean, that's really scary to me. So what was the most important lesson that you learned from the research that you did um, for the new book? Um, I, there were several, but the one that I'm thinking a lot about now um, and that that is worrying me is the the ways that the tech industry, that big tech is coming between parents and children. And, and that is really troubling. And they're doing it in a whole variety of ways. I mean, one of them is by creating um, content for their devices that is so addictive that parents are on devices so much, even when they're with their kids. And also, you know, creating tech that is so compelling that it's hard to just show a child one program on an iPhone. I mean, the problem isn't giving a two-year-old an iPhone once. The problem is that it's almost never just once because it's so powerful. The kids get completely immersed in it and you know they want the phone again and for the parents it's wow they're quiet i can do something but i mean this really came home to me when when i was writing the book i was walking and i talk about this in the book i was walking in a park near my house and, and um there was a mom sitting on a park bench with her phone she was on her phone looking at her phone scrolling and there was a toddler not too far from her dragging an enormous branch. And, and he, he said, mom, and she looked at her phone. She said, uh-huh, uh-huh. So he got a little closer and he said, mom. And she said, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he got right up to her and he said, mom. And she said, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he slugged her. So I don't believe in corporal punishment for children or for parents, but you know, I'm not surprised. He had done everything he could to get her attention and he couldn't get it. And, and what the research is showing is that when parents are on devices, 
they often don't even actually hear their kids when their kids call to them, like if, if they're at a playground and they're on their devices. And if when they do um, hear them, they, they tend to respond with anger. And the same thing is true of, um, of, of young children when they're playing with a device or with an electronic toy and they're called away from it, they also tend to respond with anger. I mean, so that's just one way that, that the tech companies are coming to, between parents and children. But another way is by advertising their devices as being able to have to act in a parental way. So, I, I mean, in the book, I talk about um, Alexa and Alexa for kids, for instance. And, you know, Amazon advertises Alexa as being, um, as, as being able to help kids with homework, to help kids with their, when they're bored, um, to, um, to amuse children, you know, all of all of the things that really are a parental, you know, function to educate kids. And, and so, but the, the, it's, and the problem is that, um, for instance, I bought an, a little device, um, the Echo Dot, which is incredibly cute. It's so cute that when I open it, I just sort of went, oh, it's a little tiger. How could it be bad? But I tried, um, I, I, I registered as a parent who had like a two or three year old and I tried their I'm bored function. I said, Alexa, I'm bored. And it proceeded to suggest five activities, all of which were ads for commercial products, American Girl, Dolls, SpongeBob SquarePants, Star Wars, Disney, you know, and so on. Um, and these, these um, devices, these personal assistants, really what they are, are the precursors of robots. You know, so so what and what's being advertised even now are social robots, which are claiming to teach kids, you know, interpersonal skills, which is so ridiculous. Or again, to help kids with homework, and and basically, what the tech industry wants is for kids to bond with the with the devices, and it starts with babies. I mean, uh, somebody sent me a product recently for parents. Um, it, it's like a headband that can hold an iPhone. And so the parents are being encouraged when they, when they change a, a baby's diaper, they're being encouraged to have the iPhone on to keep the baby still and everything. And so, I mean, when changing diapers, while, you know, it's messy, it's yucky, it's all of those things, but it's a real bonding experience. It's a time when it's just you and your baby and you can play with them. And, you know, it, 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 it it's very worrisome, you know, that, that we are training kids to love their devices, basically, and to bond with them. And there's a huge push to get, um, iPhones and tech companies, uh, I'm sorry, to get iPhones and, um, or, or smartphones, to get them marketed to ever younger children. And I saw um, a mark, I read a lot of marketing literature. I'm not sure it's literature, but whatever it is, I read it. And it says, um, that children are wanting more control over their, their entertainment and that six and seven year olds are now um, think that tablets are babyish. They want their own phones. And, you know, and I watched this happen from when, when, when smartphones were for, first introduced, there was a push because the market gets saturated. All the adults have them, we have to market to teenagers. All the teens have it, we have to market to preteens. All the preteens have it, there's no market anymore. Well, let's go to ever younger kids. Yeah. 
and 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 one of the things that you discovered via um, your your fun little tiger is um, issues of race come into that too. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, that was really shocking to me. I I had um, read um, Dr. Sophia Sophia Nobel's book. Um, algorithms of oppression, and I'd read some other books about uh, the problem with search engines and, and the, the racial biases that are embedded in them. And they're embedded in them because they work with huge data sets. And so they, and they, they don't, or they, they, they don't willingly or initially look for racism in those huge data sets. And then I thought, wow, Alexa is basically a search engine. So I went down to my kitchen and I said, Alexa, what are African-American girls? And Alexa said, African-American girls are the fastest growing segment of the juvenile justice system. I honestly, Somebody asked me, you know, if I found this work shocking. I've done it for a long time, so I'm not usually shocked anymore. I mean, it's upsetting, but it's not shocking. This was really shocking to me. And I kept asking it over and over again because I couldn't believe my ears. And then I said, well, Alexa, what are African-American boys? And it, 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 said, Af it said it was a little garbled. It gave a site and then it said, well, there were boys and they were African-American and many of them were having trouble with learning and reading. So Alexa basically told the child I was pretending to be that African-American kids are either bad or stupid. I mean, that's horrific. And at a time when books are being banned, librarians are being censored, teachers are being censored, tech industry, the tech industry can say anything it wants to children right now. We don't have very many laws in place, hardly any, that actually protect kids. And, and you have those statements on tape, right? I do, I have them. I, I even though I was, I was, shocked i did think okay i'm going to do it again and i'm going to tape them i have them on tape and i wrote an article about this that was in time and um they contacted Alex, um amazon and amazon fixed you know it, it it doesn't say that anymore if you go to alexa but i have it on tape and amazon's comment was if there's a you know alexa is it's something like Alexa's wonderful for children. And if there's a problem, we fix it as we fix this one. But they wouldn't have fixed it if, you know, if, if somebody hadn't contacted them. And, you know, so who knows how many kids were hearing who knows what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you want? What do you want readers to take away from the book? Um, I want them to understand that the digitized, commercialized world that, that even very young children wake up to every day is harmful for them, and, and also that it doesn't have to be like this. I mean, it, there, are, there are things that we can do to make a difference. And, um, you know, I've been an advocate for kids in this arena for a, a really long time. And, um, and one of the things um, that I am encouraged about is that for the first time, there actually is interest um, in Congress to do something about this. Um, Joe Biden did in his State of the Union talk about the problems of big tech and its impact on kids. Um, social change takes time, you know, I mean, things don't happen overnight and it's only because of the 
activists around the country who have been working so hard to make these changes. But the fact that it came a bill that really would have limited how the tech industry relates to children came very close to passing in the last session. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens, but it's coming around again. You know, the the Congress people who have been pushing it haven't given up and neither have the activists. So it's not hopeless. And the tech industry and the corporate America, what they want is for us to think it's so big, it's so powerful, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but once you believe that, that there's nothing you can do about it, we're in really big trouble. Mm -hmm. And you give resources in the book. I do. Yeah, I, I, um, I have a, a, a chapter um, about activism. I, I feature you know, some activists who in their own communities have made a difference. Um, and I also have a whole list of organizations that are really working on this. Um, I also have a chapter for parents about things that they can do in their own homes. But I think it's really important for people to understand that this isn't a family problem, it's a societal problem. And really, it's up to society to change it. So, you know, I know, as I said, social change takes time, but, uh, um, and so it's important for parents to have some things that they can do that can make a difference. I mean, one thing is to postpone the time that you introduce your kids to, to tech that features things for them. I mean, you know, I I don't have a, a problem with fate with babies and toddlers doing um, video chats with the adults who love them who aren't there. I mean, that serves, you know, both the babies, but also keeping, you know, grandparents and aunts and uncles engaged with the child. That's really important. But aside from that, when it comes to babies and toddlers and, and preschool kids. When it comes to babies and toddlers, there's nothing that they can benefit from online. Um, a lot of um, a lot of apps claim to teach babies and toddlers language, but what the research shows is that babies can't learn from machines. They learn in relationship, you know, to people, and and which is really neat if you think about it. Um, and, and with preschool kids, there's very little that is beneficial to them. And also so much of it is, um, is, is filled with advertising. I mean, 95% of apps for preschool kids have at least one kind of advertising in them. Right. Or say, um, you know, in-app purchases. In-app in -app purchases. And, and the other thing that's, that's troubling about so many of the apps is that the, the commercial apps is, is that advertising doesn't just um, sell products, it also sells values. So I was um, with this, this little boy in Australia and um, I, was, I was staying at his house, actually Nancy, a, a cousin of ours. And, um, and so he was five at the time. He had huge numbers of Legos, but he also had an iPad that, um, that his grandmother had given him. Uh, so he asked me if- Grandmother on the other side of the family. The grand, yeah, not our side of the family, of course not, no. Yeah, but the other side of the family gave them an iPad, uh, um, gave him an iPad. And so he asked me if I would play with him on his iPad. And I said, sure. And he said, let's play Lego racing. So I knew that Lego had apps. So that didn't surprise me. I knew it wasn't going to be creative. That didn't surprise me. So we did this racing game. And, and, you know, he won, I won, I don't remember who won. We played it a few times. And I thought that was the end of it. He said, 
now we can go shopping. So the so then we you know we went to the store which had all these virtual products and we weren't spending real money. I mean that's that is a problem. I mean with kids spending thousands of dollars, you know, without even knowing that they're doing it. We weren't spending real money, but the message that he was getting is that what you do doesn't matter. What matters is the reward that you get. And, and that's also a troubling message. And that's a message that through tech is infiltrating the schools, the whole gamification of learning. Yeah, so um, one question that we have from the audience is, um, what are your thoughts about big tech in public school classrooms? Well, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I, big tech doesn't belong in schools. I mean, it 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 really doesn't, um, especially again for the youngest children. There's there's no point to it. But but the problem is, and the pandemic, you know, made this even more um, yeah, more it, problematic. It exacerbated. Yeah. It exa works. thank you. Yes, it's so good to have a big sister who knows all the big words. Thank you. Yes, exacerbates it. Um, but you know, so so Google Classroom, for instance. I mean, when Google is in your school, Google is is or has the you know the potential to take students' personal information, and there there's no regulation about how that information can be used. That's really troubling. And, and the other problem is, is that what the tech industry is saying, and this is just about a direct quote, is, you know, if you get a kid on your platform when they're young, you'll have that child for life. I mean, so, you know, I mean, if, if we really cared about children, if we really cared about education, if we really believed that it was important to have tech in the schools, then there would be a, you know, a company that is not totally focused on profit that is doing this. I mean, you know, Google is dumping Chromebooks into schools, which seems like it's so altruistic, but it's to hook kids on Google. And, and, and so big tech, um, it, big tech doesn't belong in schools. And you know the technology develops so quickly that we don't have time to really think carefully about what the ramifications are. And they're so good at marketing that you know, I mean, what the argument is: kids have to learn to use technology because they're going to need it when they get jobs. But the the tech when when kids who are young today when they grow up the tech isn't gonna be the same. I mean, they're not gonna benefit from knowing how to swipe and you know make things bigger and stuff like that. They're not gonna benefit from that. It's probably you know all gonna be voice basically mm -hmm. or something that I, I can't even conceive of. Are there any, this is another, um, another question from the audience. Are there any studies that have shown the impact of marketing to kids? Um, yes. Does that impact their long long term beliefs and choices? There's um, evidence that kids exposed to commercialism um, are more materialistic than kids who aren't exposed or to to the same amount of commercialism. There aren't long term studies that I mean concern about this hasn't been going on for long enough. But there are studies, you know, showing that that brand loyalty really does begin in childhood. And one brand loyal customer is worth a ton of money to a corporation. So there is research showing that it has an impact. And you know, we use products from our childhood. I mean, I tend to buy the same toothpaste that we used when we were kids or, or, or cereals, you know, that, that brought us comfort. We tend to buy those as well. 
Um, I know in your in your you know resources that you offer parents and readers in in the book. Do you include resources for understanding um, or, or for helping parents figure out how to structure their lives to 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 mitigate the influence of big tech? I mean, because you know, just as much as all of this is aimed at kids, it's aimed at adults right. as, as well. And everything that you said about, um, you know, you could talk about attention span and all of that. I mean, that's that's aimed at adults. But one of the audience um, members wants to know, you know, are there stories of people, or can we find stories of people? who are living alternative lives, alternative to, you know, not having smartphones, you know, not shopping on Amazon, not doing name brands. What do you think? Sure. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I think a couple of things. One is, as I said, I have a whole chapter in the book with suggestions for parents. I mean, and, um, and I have, there are organizations, you know, that are around to help parents. There's a, a great organization called Wait Until Eighth that is working, you know, to help parents figure out how to organize the parents in their, in their child's grades to everybody agree, or as many as possible, agree not to get your child a smartphone until eighth grade. I mean, so, so there are lots uh, not lots, but there are some very good organizations you know, that are out there working locally, and I do include them um, in my book. And um, Fair Play, which is the organization that I, I founded in 2000 and is now called Fair Play and is just doing splendidly without me. Um, they have um, the Screen Time Action Network, and if you're if you're concerned about screen time, um, and you want to find other people, and 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 if you want to to see if there's something you can do about it, I really suggest that you go to ScreenTimeActionNetwork.org and look at at that website, um, and um, and they have tons of resources as well. But the thing about um, we can't all move to the woods and unplug. I mean, we can't, we can't all do that. So parents need help about how to live in this society. Maybe if they have the time and energy work to make changes, but also how to raise kids who will thrive um, in this, you know, commercialized digitized culture that is so destructive for them. Um, one of the parts of the book that I really enjoyed reading was that at the head of every chapter, um, you you have an anecdote um, of an experience that you had with a child. Um, could you talk about some of those? Yeah. Um, again, I'm going to bring us back to family again, but... Um, my cousin Ellen... Oh, I'm sorry I did it again, Nancy. Our cousin Ellen... Um, she reminded me it's our cousin, not just my cousin. Um, our cousin Ellen um, was taking care of her 14-month-old granddaughter. And Ellen is also somebody who's an early childhood person. And so um, her granddaughter, Arielle, was 14 months old. And she was sitting on a blanket with, with toys that, you know, the toy industry today would make fun of. I mean, they're so retro. An old baby doll, a big pair, a, a big bear. And um, my cousin took a video of her playing with the baby doll. And she was like mouthing the baby doll, you know, the arm and everything in her hand was kind of fiddling along. And suddenly she felt the doll's toes. And then she kind of, you could see her brain working. She reached up and felt her ear. I mean, I could sort of see her thinking protrusions, you know, and, and then, but it wasn't right. And so then her hand kind of went up to the doll's ear and she felt the doll's ear and she felt her own ear. 
Then she felt the doll's ear again. And then she felt both of her ears. She did it one more time. And then she just went on to something else. But when, when I got that video, honestly, I got chills because it was such an extraordinary example of human learning. That, that this is what happens when babies are given the time, the space, the silence, the inspiration to explore. I mean, we are wired, driven to learn. I mean, if you've ever watched babies or toddlers learning to walk or, or a preschooler trying to tie their shoes, or I mean, we, we want to learn and, and to see that, and then to go online and look at, at video after video of kids with iPads listening to apps that say things like, um, use your words. I mean, there's one on there where this little girl is, you know, just face down, you know, doing this with a, a phone. And it says, use your words. She's absolutely silent. She doesn't say anything. I, so so that's that was, you know, really... Um, extraordinary. And one of the anecdotes is the one I talked about, about the mother with the, um, you know, with the iPhone. And, and, and one of the things I think it's important, um, I, I, I say this in, in, in the book, and when I, when I give talks, I give a lot of talks um, for, for parent groups. And I'm not here to make parents feel guilty. It's hard to be a parent. Um, it's, and especially, you know, if you're working full time, you're a single parent, you're tired, you know, who knows, whatever. It's hard to be a parent. And it can also be boring, you know, with, you know, to be with a baby or young children. There are times when it's boring. And people think, that the message they're getting is you either have to play with your child or they have to be on the phone. And, and, and so it, I wanna say again, first of all, it's not, it's hard to be a parent and, and we shouldn't blame parents for how they're managing this. I don't know what I would do today. I, I mean, I raised you know, my daughter before all of this. And I will say that when I went to the playground, I brought a book. You know, I read a lot, you know, when when my daughter was playing. And, you know, I was hoping that she would do some playing by herself, which she did. Um, so I understand the lure of these devices. And I know how addictive they are. We're all addicted to them. I mean, I don't exclude myself from that. But um, I think, um, and that circles me back to the ways that they're coming between parents and children. Did I answer your question? Oh, Nancy, I can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, here's a follow-up follow question, which has to do with attention span and what, uh -huh. what um, gadgets, tech gadgets, have done to attention span for for children and adults. Uh -huh. um, you know what yeah. about you know what's the answer? You know the answer to that issue because that certainly has an, a huge implication for schools. If kids, it, it's it it's really really troubling. Um, and what the research is showing that um, the you know that that kids who are immersed in screens, like before the age of two, that they have problems with what the jargon is executive function. That's the ability to initiate an activity and follow it through to the end. And they have problems with self-regulation, which you know is you know self-control and the you know the ability to withhold, you know, to postpone gratification. And also um, there, you know, there is evidence that there is problems with attention. And, 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 um, and Nancy, you'll, you'll like this. One of the things um, that the research is, always, is also showing, you know, 
we know a lot about what kids need to thrive. I mean, they need to bond with parents. They need to have interactions that go back and verbal interactions and playful interactions that go back and forth. They need um, all of those things and, and they benefit from being read to. And so people often say, well, why can't I read to them on an ebook? Well, first of all, what the research is showing is that the bells and whistles on those kinds of ebooks um, interfere with the kinds of conversations that adults and children have that promote literally literacy, because you're not talking about the story. You're talking about do this, make the butterfly flap its wings, you know, that kind of thing. But even reading just from a an ebook that doesn't have any of those bells or whistles, even that's problematic because they're built for individual use. So there is a lot of struggle for where the book is going to, the ebook is going to be, and who's controlling it. And again, parents aren't having the kind of conversations that that promote a love of words and a love of story and that kind of thing. So, you know, yay books. Yeah, right, yay books. <laughs> yay bedtime stories. Um, Absolutely. What about big tech and the food industry? Is there some, some, something that, you know, you're seeing there? Well, you know, one thing is um, what, what, what all of these industries are doing are staking out a claim in the metaverse. You know, so, you know, McDonald's world and, you know, we can, you know, the advertising is getting, you know, more insidious and more powerful. Um, all of the corporations, including the food industry, are using influencers, you know, people who look like, you know, just, oh, I'm just a person, you know, and what the, but I just love Burger King or I just love Taco Bell or, you know, I'm eating this enormous whatever. Isn't that great? Um, but really, they're being paid by the companies, you know, to, or getting free products or, you know, getting something from them. And that kind of advertising is very powerful for children, you know, and for adults. Um, so when you were talking about, you know, wait until eight, um, grade eight to give a, a child a smartphone. In some ways, um, that comes up against the need, you know, all of these school shootings and the need of children to get in touch with parents or parents to get in touch with children. So, you know, I mean, obviously you, you could just give a child a flip phone, but then that sets that child apart from you know, everybody else. Yeah, they kind of have got us coming and going, you know. Um, one of the things that the marketing industry is very good at doing is exploiting problems in society. And so, you know, so exploiting, you know, the fact that we can't control guns in this country, we refuse to control guns and all these horrible school shootings, you know, what the tech industry, you know, saying, well, you know, you, the kids need cell phones, but I, you know, first of all, if you really, really feel that your child needs a phone, and, and I would question that for young children, for sure, um, then a flip phone you know, it's fine. Again, if you can find other parents who shall share your values, that's a way to, you know, help your child not be the only one. But so you raised like a million things in that question, Nancy. I mean, because ordinarily, wait, you're muted. Oh, you're not muted anymore. But Ordinarily, you know, what I would say is it, you, a young child doesn't need a phone because they're always with an adult. And in fact, the teacher would have a phone. You know, I mean, I don't, it's horrible to think of, you know, a young child there. I mean, it's horrible to think about. I'm not sure that 
having a cell phone would really help anything. And I hadn't thought of this before, but I suppose you don't want kids talking on phones when they're there's an active shooter, you know, in, you know, you don't want their phones to ring. And, and there is, you know, a, 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 a movement beginning to actually keep cell phones out of schools. They don't, they don't benefit really anybody. So let me ask you one more question um, before we have to go. Um, We've been so successful in making so many products safe for children. So what is stopping us, us, the country, from making tech safe for kids? Um, it's the same, the same thing that allowed tobacco companies to advertise cigarettes, even after they knew that they had cancer. I mean, the tech industry has huge amounts of money and um, lots and lots of lobbyists in Congress, they donate to Congress. I mean, really, you know, we should, you know, stop that kind of corporate donation to, you know, to politicians. Um, that's stopping us. The other thing that that's stopping us is that we all love our devices. And, you know, and, and another thing that's stopping us is is I think a lack of understanding about child development. So the so parents are being pushed to get their kids devices, you know, two and three year olds even devices because they're educational without, you know, we don't teach child development in schools. It, it, it's not part of our education. So the idea that, you know, sh young children learn with with all of their senses and their whole bodies. I mean, that's what's so great about the Discovery Museum and, and, and other children's museums where it is a place that the kids can go that you know, may well be take tech free and where they can have really meaningful um, experiences without technology. And that's you know, what kids really need today. So, um, hi. <laughs> Hi. That, Hi, Neil. Yeah. I, I think um, I thought once you mentioned the Discovery Museum, I should pop right back. I, in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a great museum. That's my own truth in advertising, really. <laughs> I believe that. So well, that's great. Um, Susan and Nancy, thank thank you. Um, you know, this was a great example of sort of our, our theme this year, which is to, you know, take tough topics and really understand them better. But I think you've, you know, throughout this, you you gave us reason to hope, mostly because you're out there working so hard uh, on this issue on behalf of all of the kids. So that's very hopeful. I, I I would encourage everybody to look for the subtly covered colored yellow and red book <laughs> in their bookstore. Um, who's raising the kids? Um, I, you know, I think the the yellow is caution and the red is stop. I think is sort of the the uh, the subtle message of the color there, um, you know, it's a great opportunity, and your I'm sure your local bookstore uh, has it. So, uh, you know, on behalf of of everybody in the in the audience, Susan, thank you, Nancy, great questions, uh, thank you for facilitating tonight. Um, you know, a link uh, to tonight's recording will be sent out to everybody as soon as it's available. Uh, we'll hope you'll take a moment to complete the survey that will be emailed to you immediately following uh, the conclusion of, of tonight's webinar. Your feedback is really important to us. It's, uh, it's how we plan these future events. Um, so on behalf, of, on behalf of everyone, thank you all and, and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.